when did you last change your mind about something? That's a brilliant question. When did I last change my mind about something? Mm. Uh, probably what I was going to have for breakfast. Mm. <laughs> but to go a little bit deeper with it, I don't know. I run the the battle with myself very often of going what I want to do, not just on a daily basis, but just life in general. So the number of times I've gone, I, I've got, there's so many things I want to do, but I have to prioritize. So I find that's what happens for me is I change my mind going, no, this needs to be the new priority. I'll be working on something and I'm like, this can't be the priority anymore as much as I'll probably want to do it. This now has to be the priority. So I'm always changing my mind in terms of what project becomes the priority. And uh, yeah, so that's, uh, I'd say that's the, the kind of more honest answer, I suppose. Yeah. What what kind of dictates priorities for you um, sort of nowadays? And has that, has that changed at all? Uh, d- definitely family related stuff it's the stuff where you go cool i would like to do this but i've got to be the provider the breadwinner for for the family first so there's some stuff where i go i'll put that on the back burner because this is uh paid work to be completely blunt and as much as i love it because i'm still a musician for a living and all this kind of stuff i go right okay i've got to prioritize that because this person needs a solo by the end of a week and they pay more than this person. Sorry, sorry, that person, but I've got to prioritize that because it's more urgent and they're going to pay more. So sometimes it, it, it just comes down to actual uh, financial career reasons. And then there's sometimes where just passion projects, whether it's a book or whether it's new music or something where you just go, I want to do this but I'm kind of at the mercy of other people's deadlines. And that's kind of what happens a lot of the time. Hence why I change my mind on something. I'll go full steam ahead on something. But when other people get involved, I have to be very mindful of what they need and when they need it for. So the number of times I've dropped everything and gone, right, I don't want to be that guy who holds everything up for everybody else. So I just constantly like turn and throw in between different projects and their level of where they are on the priority list keeps changing until the projects are, are done. So my passion projects kind of keep getting pushed further and further back because they're the stuff I can do kind of any time, really. Hmm. I know um, the sort of stereotypical musician is the kind of um, free spirit, kind of creative and, and and all this. And But do you think there are some, maybe some sort of benefits to having these deadlines? Like it sort of, um, I know if I have... Uh, it's all it's it's great sort of waking up and having a free day and just being able to be creative and do what I want or whatever it is, or even just like a free afternoon or something. Um, but sometimes just having a deadline or having something you have to do, it almost makes you, you know, they say give if you want something done, give it to a busy person, don't they? They say that. Um yeah. do you think maybe things have changed where actually in some sort of beneficial way where um these deadlines and the sort of things that you have to do in life maybe make you value your time a bit more than perhaps, I don't know, than, than what, than how people view the typical musician who's just sort of, you know, I guess the uh, sort of, I don't want to stereotype sort of sat around all day trying to, you know, be creative, I guess. That's the thing. It's um, obviously being a family man now, like our, our son has just turned three. So for, for the last three plus years, obviously my life has completely changed. Even me and my partner were, were together for quite a while before our son came along. I was still living the kind of almost single man musician lifestyle. Not in the sense I was like, not the stereotypical one, I suppose, but it was just like, no, I'll just do what I want when I need to do it and whatever. Now that I'm up at like 5 a.m. <laughs> and I'm going to bed much earlier and family time and other things can get in the the way. It's almost like I need like, right, I need, I've got this amount of time to be creative. But in a weird way, I've always kind of been like that because I've always set those deadlines for myself. I find if like, like weirdly enough, you want something done, you give it to a busy person. It's very true because I find myself going, if I give myself time to do it, it won't get done because I end up putting it off to the last moment and 
it's almost like I work better under pressure. So I've always given myself deadlines, whether it was writing for a band or doing guest solos, writing a book. It didn't matter what it was. It was almost like, right, okay, there's not a hard deadline, but I'm going to give myself a hard deadline. And it's amazing what happens. I, I've got a lot of, obviously a lot of creative friends who, when they say the same, it's almost like you treat it like I'm going to work between this hour and this hour and the rest of the day is the rest of the day to do whatever you want with. And it's amazing what you can come up with when that's the plan. Like my book would never have been written had I not like said right from this hour to this hour every morning, I'm going to write and I'm going to do nothing else. If, when I'm writing albums with any of my bands that I've been in, had I sat down and cut, even with Cradle of Filth, it was like, yes, there is a deadline, but it's quite a, far away. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, you got to get writing. It's like, mm, yeah, okay, I will. And I'm, I'm always writing anyway, but at the same time, like person, I'm like, right, today I'm going to write this part of a song. Today, I mean, it's amazing what happens. I'll go, right, today I'm going to write a riff. And just sitting down and going to work almost. Mate, don't wait for the muse to come. Just actually start, get a guitar in my hand and go, oh, I'm going to write a riff. And nine times out of ten, I'll finish the song. It will start off with me going, I need this deadline. I need to write a riff. Today I'm going to write a riff. You'll be surprised how often that turns into a full song. Uh, whereas if I was kind of sat there waiting for the muse or going, oh, I'll kind of do it whenever, it never happens because I don't know why my, my brain just seems to work better when there's almost that self-imposed pressure. Mm. It's my, always been the case. Yeah. My sort of hot take is that the, uh, the common, uh, sort of musician, uh, what a lot of musicians say is they sort of wait for lightning to strike, you know, and, and all that. And, and I, I, my hot take is I just kind of think that's BS basically. I think, it is. I, I think there are it is. lots of very talented musicians out there who are quite fortunate in that that happens to them. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I'm kind of a firm believer that nine out of 10 of them would probably be even better off if they knew how to sort of capture that moment or recreate it yeah. more, more readily. It's why I try and just, so a few things I've imposed on myself is one, I only work on one song at a time now. Um, and however painful that might be, um, because I know if I just try and work on even literally even two, one of them will just end up kind of falling behind. Um, so I just get things done so that I know I've got like a finished article at the end. Mm. Um, and two is I kind of do it. I force myself to do it in hopefully not too many hours. If those hours are spread over maybe a few weeks or whatever, that's fine. Um, but it's those hours sat in front of it. Um, I don't put a number on it, but maybe I should, I don't know. Would that be a good idea? Saying, okay, I'm going to write a song in, I don't know, what, how many hours would be a good, like 15, 20 hours or something? One. Know. One, yeah. One. Nice. Why, why, why <laughs> not only, only because, oh, the only oh, reason I say that, I'm not saying like the whole song, but if you've got like the skeleton of an idea, um, if it's cooking, it'll come quick. Mm -hmm. um, all the songs I've written that have appeared on albums of the skeleton of the ideas come very quickly mm. uh, it's like that weird moment when you get into that kind of flow state where it's just like okay i've got a riff now i've got i've got a verse whoa this is the chorus is coming pretty quickly you know what i mean so don't, don't get me wrong there are times when it seems to come out quicker and more easily but if i feel like if i if i give myself too much time i'm kind of beating a dead horse really. And I end up going, oh, something will come, something will come. And if it's not coming quick, it doesn't happen at all. Mm. Uh, but that doesn't mean I don't sit that down and try and do something with it. It's not, a, it's not wasted time because you're just flexing that writing muscle. It's like, I'm not in any active bands at the moment. It's, but it doesn't mean I'm not writing. You know what I mean? I'm just sit down. I always pick up a guitar. I'm always writing something every single day just for fun. And you never know, there's a backlog of material that might come out and some stuff's great, some of it's not so great, but you have to kind of chip away at it. You've got to actively write. I've, I've never been one of those people who can write and then do nothing until you go, right, it's time to do another album. I'll get writing again then. It's I've, I've, 
it almost takes me a good few songs to go that's awful that's awful that's all and now it's starting to sound something like i'm proud of so as long as i'm writing pretty constantly in consistency i, f I find I, I don't allow myself to get into that kind of lull which i've, I've noticed quite a few musicians are can be guilty of doing that but some of them are so bloody talented they can not write anything forever and we go oh i need a song do i okay there you go and it's just how it goes but unfortunately i'm i'm not that lucky yeah i i i um i found which when we were just talking before um before the cameras were rolling the uh i was talking about putting some demos together and so like, like i said i'm working on number five at the moment of this latest kind of batch of stuff um and kind of had a bit of a unintentional writing hiatus where I just didn't, I don't know. I didn't know what I was writing for or what, you know, it's hard to do it when you don't feel like there's any direction there, you know? Um, so I commend it you is. Able to do it without it, but I found the first couple of songs, the first one in particular, there's definitely bits that I like and it's well structured, I think. Um, but there are some bits I think, oh, they're a bit clunky, but then demo two is a bit more co coherent. And then three and four, I was like, oh, okay, I really like these. I could definitely work with these. Now this one I'm working on at the moment feels like another one of those, hopefully. So mm -hmm. I think um, I was chatting to Al Levy of, from URM. He's in is it Darth, is that how you say it? Yeah, yeah, Darth, yeah. And uh, He's a good guy. Yeah, and he was saying, like, for him, if he's not been writing for a while, the first three weeks are just – it's basically just shit. It's just like, just whatever he turns out is not stuff that he's particularly proud of, I guess. Hmm. But but you just have to kind of get over that, I think. Um, it's you, like you do. I think it's going to the gym. You feel all achy and then you get back in and you feel all right, you know. That's the thing. I think it's consistency. Like, you, you, if you haven't done anything for a while, you can't, like, even if I have to, like, take a break from playing guitar for a while and then I go back to it, I'm like, I can't expect myself to be peak condition because I've had maybe two weeks off but you may not be physically in peak condition but having that break sometimes is good so sometimes even with writing sometimes I will have a break and then you come back with I don't know I've been listening to new artists different styles music who, whoever it is or get get rejuvenated by some of my heroes from when I was a kid you know what I mean like you kind of hear it differently like I put on a Metallica record I've not heard in about 10 years purely because like and justice for all or something i can air drum the whole album because i just listened to it to death when i was a kid and then you put it on knowing what you know now about playing guitar and songwriting and production and you go oh, okay i'm kind of renewed by this so sometimes taking breaks is good but like you were saying how it took a couple of songs for you to go oh, okay now i'm feeling my way at the same time you can't be kind of bummed out if like songs five and six don't get you as excited as songs three and four you kind of just have to keep writing and like say some of them turn out to be better than others sometimes the best songs i've written in my opinion for, for a certain album i've been working on is the first song i wrote purely because i got really excited about it and then sometimes the best song i wrote was like the seventh song I wrote for it. You just keep going because you never know if you're going to find something better. And if you don't, don't hold yourself to blame too much. Because everyone's always striving for perfection. And if the song you're currently writing isn't as good as the last one you wrote, you kind of think, oh, God, is, is, is that it? Have I, have I, I don't know, shot my load on my first couple of songs? And that's that. But it's not the case. As long as you keep doing it, it's amazing what comes out. Mm. Yeah, I um, uh, I had two things I was gonna say. Oh, one was I for the first time. I I don't know if you've heard this, but having I didn't realize. I don't know why I never thought about this, but the intro to Blackened. Speaking of Injustice for All, mm. I heard it the right way round for the first time. You know the yeah. If you heard it like flipped, yeah, yeah, it not not reversed. Uh, not, yeah, yeah. Not, I suppose oh, not reversed. Yeah, yeah. I, like, realized, not, I don't know why. I've not heard that in a long time. Yeah, but I I have heard it. Yeah. I don't know why I never thought about the fact that that, that they'd done that. It, it, in my head, it was just this backwards thing. I don't know why I never thought about it. And then listening to it forward, it's like, oh, this is really cool. Um, little gems like that are, um, yeah. And I, I found, uh, oh, that was the other thing I was going to say when I was, um, I actually played, I end up um, at the end of one of my lessons. I've got a student who's quite into his metal stuff. And um, I'm trying to write sort of rocky metal ideas but like try and sort of tread the line between them nicely. And and I played him a couple of things 
And he went, yeah, I don't know what genre I'd call that. And I was like, ah, that's a good sign. Hopefully, you know, because um, if someone just goes, oh, that's clearly metalcore or it's clearly whatever, or just hard rock, it, you, you maybe feel like you've fallen into a bit of a um, pigeonhole. But so hopefully we'll see. Um, yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with with labeling something, but I think labeling something just makes it easier to put it on the shelves. That's the only thing I've ever seen it as. It's like, is it rock or metal? I don't really care. But people who are stocking your album might want to know which section to put it in. And that's literally all it's for, as far as I'm concerned. It's like, obviously, a band like Faith No More always gets lumped into the the rock and metal crowd, and understandably so, but a lot of their songs are very not rock and metal. You know what I mean? It's, it's So I, I, I never tend to worry about what genre it is, unless I'm writing for a particular artist, then I just delve deep into what they're doing and go, okay, it's definitely this. Don't do this. <laughs> when I write, sometimes I just like to write to a brief, and I f- find, like, weirdly enough, I write at my best when I write to a brief. Okay. Is that I want, a brief that you're given, or or could it be one that you? It, it's it's kind of it's kind of self-imposed. Even when I was writing for Cradle, when I first joined the band, and I did that first tour as like a session member. Well, technically, I was a session member the whole time I was in in the band, but like just an actual writing member as well. That first album I did in 2015, it came out. So I was writing throughout the last half of 2014. And I kind of just delved into Cradle's music and go, well, what makes a Cradle song sound like a Cradle song? And then, um, I don't know, it's kind of nice in that sense where you go, well, I, I, I won't do this, this, or this, or this. I won't go into some crazy 16th note disco strumming pattern. Like that would totally not suit the song at all. But they do this, this, and this. So I like to, to write that. So it's a lot of it is self, self-imposed and then some of it is quite obvious. So even when, like, for example, on the last Cradle album I wrote, I, I co-wrote, you get like certain songs. I'm writing some songs and then the other guys are writing some songs. And then you kind of hear what we got and we go, okay, we're missing this kind of song. We've got a lot of fast songs. We need a slower, more anthemic song. Cool. I'll, and it's almost like, right, now I'm going to get to work with that kind of song in mind um and sometimes even when i'm just writing for other artists that that is that's my kind of mission statement to myself it's like yes do it in the same style as the artist but don't go too far because then all of a sudden i'll sound like i'm plagiarizing their back catalog so just kind of take like four or five things where it's like kind of needs this in it and then the rest of it is fair game because as soon as you get the other instruments and especially the singer involved in theory, it's going to sound like that band anyway. Mm-hmm. So I like to have those self-imposed kind of uh, parameters when I'm writing, even when I'm just writing for myself, I'm like, right, what, what should we do? <laughs> like I did a, a song recently where the brief was that me and this other artist talked about we're like, what should we do? And and apparently the, the, the thing he came out with, he said, imagine if Alice in Chains and Thin Lizzy got into a bar fight and it was perfect. I was like, cool. Now I know what, being a big fan of both bands, I was like, now I know what to do and I know what not to do. And we ended up coming out with a pretty cool song because of it. Nice. Yeah, I, I can totally resonate. I've literally just been thinking with um, the stuff I'm writing. I've tried to steer away from the riffy stuff a little bit. And I realised I haven't written anything riffy for a while, so I quite like to get some riffs back. So I think I'm going to sit down and do that. And I think it's yeah, yeah you can. Um, again, I think it's um, there's the creative process is sort of um, uh, sort of enshrined as this very important thing that you can't. I think I think there's this idea that you can't sort of tamper with it. And actually, I think you can. You know, you can say Absolutely. I'm going to do this today, or I'm going to. Um, whereas it's seen as this very sort of um, uh, uh, what's the word? sort of hard to capture kind of thing. Whereas I think you can sort of um, be a bit more, what's the word, constructive with it. That's what I found. And I found that to be really useful. Um, yeah. So, I mean, in terms of your, like the different pursuits you have, do you do you enjoy kind of spinning a lot of plates um, in that way? Or or do you prefer it when you've just got one big thing to be working on? What, what kind of? Um, 
I think when I was younger, I liked spinning plates. Um, even not that long ago, like before I became a family man, I was like working on cradle albums, working on other bands' albums, uh, teaching, lecturing, doing musical theatre. I was doing all sorts uh, just because the time was there and because I loved it and I could do it. Why not? I didn't have much of a social life. That kind of was my social life, was doing these gigs and performances and stuff. So, But now it's a little bit different where, I, I don't know, the older I've got, I feel like I do like to have a project and then kind of tick it off before I move on to the next one. Even when I'm doing guest solos for people, yes, I will like book guest solos and I might have like three or four lined up or whatever. But I will go, right, I'm going to make a point of today is working purely on this person's. I'm not going to like record four separate ones and then go, oh, which one was which? And it started, I don't know, my brain's getting a bit foggier over the years to a point where it's like I like to have a, a project that's that's done and dusted before I move on to the next one. But again, like going back to what we were on about before, sometimes it's needs must, sometimes the priority list it's like, okay, I've, I've got to juggle things because I'm waiting for somebody else to finish their bit and they've got their own priority list. <laughs> and this project, somebody else has got their own priority list. So I've got to wait for them to finish their parts before I can even start mine. But then I've started one over here. And, and sometimes, sometimes it's just the way it is because everyone's busy. Everyone's got their own lives and families and projects and ev everything's got on their own separate priority list so a lot of times as much as i would love to have a project get it done move on and that was when it was kind of easier when i was in cradle of filth it was like okay that is the priority get this album done get the songs written once the guitars are recorded i can kind of cool off and start working on other stuff whereas now it's a little bit different in the sense i've still got quite a few things on but like you say you've got to wait for people who've got nine to five jobs and then a family and then they'll record their parts. So like 11 o'clock at night, I'm getting like the bass line come to me. Okay, cool. <laughs> like, and kind of just waiting for bits and bobs to be done. So the, the things take a little bit longer purely because, um, again, the priority list is, is a little bit different to what it was when um, I was actively in bands, you know? Mm. Yeah, I um, I definitely, I, I, um, I can't remember I heard this, um, and this is going to, sort of you know when you're sort of trying to sound scientific and you're like i'm sure i heard this somewhere um so but i i remember hearing that the there's a very strong correlation between um uh just like happiness um and whether you complete tasks basically it's a simple way of putting it you know um and i think th this is partly why for example i've started doing one song at a time mm. um because I feel like it, when you don't feel like you're completing anything or you do, but then you're so busy with the other things that you don't feel a sense of like um, not accomplishment, but just um, progress, I guess. Mm. Uh, I think it's very easy to feel quite stagnant, ironically, when you're doing lots of different things. Um, I've certainly found that, you know, if I'm busy teaching and doing the podcast and trying to write songs and then I'm trying to go to the gym as well and like all this stuff, mm. when all of this stuff is sort of going forwards but not like as measurably as maybe you'd like sometimes when you just have one thing that you just focus on it's nice to to see that move forward i think i think it's quite good you know for absolutely I, I i mean i obviously I, I won't mention the names but i've got a, a couple of friends who are really like some of the most stupidly talented people i've ever met in my life uh, but they've never finished anything and they kind of, one, they're, they're not very happy. They t two, they feel quite frustrated that life didn't exactly go the way it should have done or they wanted it to. And its I genuinely think it's not because they weren't talented because they are genuinely some of the most talented people I've met in my life. They just didn't finish it. They were so in pursuit of perfection. Maybe there's another psychological reason. I don't know. Maybe they're scared to finish something because then when it's done, it's done. What are they if they're not actively working on this thing and kind of scared to put it out because then it's like, well, that's that, that's it. And uh, I can understand that because even when I left Cradle, there was a side of going, well, cool, I'm, I'm going to leave this pretty sure thing. And then, then what? 
you know, so I could understand that kind of thing. But it's, I do think striving for perfection. I mean, there's, I'm sure there's a f- famous quote out there, but to, to me, striving for perfection kind of can ruin creativity. I genuinely mm. think that I, I'm at my most creative. And I know a lot of people are when it's like, I'm not aiming for perfection. I, I just, not only is it good, it's good enough. Um, sometimes it's one of those, it's, it's like when I wrote the book, it's like, this is as good as I feel I can get it at this point in time. I could literally sit on the draft of my book for another year, change a word here, change a chapter there. And it got to the point where, again, going back to the deadlines, it's like, no, I'm sticking to my deadline. I'm, I said this deadline, it's done. I'm as happy as I can possibly be at this moment in time. It's going out. Had I not had that mentality, that book still would be sat on my hard drive waiting to be finished. Same for any song I've ever written. Same for any album. If I was that precious about it, working with, with the guys and girls of Cradle, I would never have even shown them a song. Because I'd be like, no, no, it's not, it's not ready yet. It's not ready yet. So the demo would never even be heard by the other people in the band. There comes a point where you just have to go, it's as good as I can get it at this point in time. Now I need other people to hear it or see it or whatever it might be that you're working on. And yes, I think striving for perfection is is a bad way to go personally. Because mm. who can decide it's perfect? You could think it's perfect and then you go to out and it doesn't it doesn't get rave reviews. That's gonna mess you up a little bit as well, because you're like, oh, well, I did I put my life into this and nobody cared. Then what? <laughs> I think as long as it depends what you've I think um the way to I I think the way to look at it is perfect. It's um I, if you f- say I finish a song in, for me, a good time frame, you know, if I'm fairly uninterrupted, for me personally, it's about two weeks. I like to think that's a good, you know, um, I found I sort of interrupted it myself by just various excursions and things. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, and for me, I think a good way to define it is perfect for two weeks of hard work, you know, um, rather than perfect as my whole life's work, you know, um, I think that's a good, I personally think that's a good way to look at it. And I think as long as you, you know, I think they're striving for perfection. Um, in some ways it's good. Cause you know, there might just be that little extra note that you wanted in and you just, you're working, but as long as you're moving forward, I think it's okay. Um, yeah. but when you start moving in circles, um, like I, I had it with, um, with my last demo I was working on where I was kind of, it just does. It wasn't feeling right, and I, like I said, because I'm only doing one at a time. I, I was kind of stuck with it. I was like, I don't know where to go. Um, and I'm quite proud of myself just for pushing through it and trying to get. Because I could probably have just thrown like a random chorus in there or whatever, and not not got what I want at, wanted out of it. Um, mm. So it's it's definitely a, a balancing act, I think. Um, but so with, um, I know last time we spoke, um, we talked about sort of imposter syndrome as a um, sort of theme, I guess. Mm. Um, and um and that was quite some interesting sort of um i know when i put some of the clips out it was sort of well received you know people sort of um i think quite appreciated your take on it um is there anything sort of changed in how you just how you view things it since we last spoke in terms of um you know how you process this kind of this kind of thing no no, no, <laughs> no. It, I don't know. Maybe I will the older I get, but there's always a side of me that's just like, even when I was like touring the world and all this kind of stuff, like whether it was with Cradle or King Eight Ten, um, there was still a side of me that was always like, "Am I good enough to do this?" You know what I mean? And it it, it almost doesn't matter what. It was, I'd, I'd not to get too deep with it, but even when it was like becoming a father, it was like, uh, am, am I, is this a good idea? Because am I ever going to be good enough? Am I ever going to be enough for whatever I'm asked to do? Even when I do guest solos for people, thinking like, thinking, how dare I think I could be an author, like write my own book. Like what, there, there were times where I was like, who's going to care? Like, and I just got away with that. I think I just got got away with that mentality, and that helped. 
that helped a lot when it was like, okay, I've got, yes, I do get imposter syndrome. However, I've kind of learned to coexist with it. Same as anxiety. I do have anxiety and I, I've just, I just know it will always be there, but I've just learned to exist with it. You know, it kind of, in a weird way, it kind of spurs me on a little bit. Yeah. Well, they, I don't they, feel the anxiety or that feeling of imposter syndrome. It's almost like, okay, now I'm, now what? It, it obviously goes the other way around. It's like, why am I so confident with this? Hmm, maybe that's a, that's a, a, a warning. That's a red flag. If I'm too confident with this, <laughs> that's probably not good. That's not a good sign. It's probably going to fall flat on its face. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting. Um, I know there's a. Uh, um, it does feel like in in you hear about all these sort of really high achievers, you know, and in, in the sort of more celebrity world, and there's almost always a trade off, you know, where, um, you know, something went where I don't know they had um a really rubbish childhood or they, um, or they have major problems with you know um what mental health in some way or um some sort of addiction or, or, or abuse or anything, you know, um. And it does seem like there's this kind of um, apparent sort of trade-off where some of these real high achievers um, are driven by some of the most sort of negative things. Um, and it's, it seems like an interesting one. I guess, you know, you never hear about all the people who have sort of driven by negative things that don't succeed. But um, there does seem to be this kind of, I think people pedestalize some of the um, the real high achievers without realizing maybe that they're not really very happy with the success they've had, you know, a bit of a sort of tangent from what you said, but somewhat related. No, it is definitely related. Like, I, I don't know if you're a fan of, do, do you watch a lot of podcasts and yeah, quite a few. Yeah. Like, yeah. like do you watch like diary of a CEO? Yeah. Yeah. CEO? yeah, yeah I'm, I'm a big fan of Stephen Bartlett and, I guess and so, yeah. all that kind of stuff. And yeah, like that's, that's a lot of stuff to process what some of these stupidly successful people come out with and you kind of it, I know it sounds horrible to say this out loud but I'm going to say it the number of times I'm gone I'm glad it's not just me yeah oh sorry I don't oh. know if you heard that there heard what uh, all of a sudden a YouTube video just started playing on my mine does that every now again I'd, I'd had it paused for for ages, and it just started playing. I was like, "Whoa!" So Mine sorry does that. that. I'm glad. <laughs> funnily enough, I'm glad it's not just me. <laughs> but, I had um, a bit of a sorry, bit of a side. I had that about two in the morning, not long ago. I left my PC on, and a YouTube video starts playing. That scared the shit out of me. Oh, <laughs> just, yeah. I, I've, I'll be honest. I've never had that happen before. That's really weird. But I was just maybe watching it's because a, a of me. Ironically, a podcast I was watching, mm. uh, and I thought like, we're about to start this. I'll pause it, and it just started playing. So I'm glad you couldn't hear that. Obviously, it just came through my headphones. Yeah, but, yeah, no, I didn't. Uh, but anyway, yeah, carry but, on. You're saying about um, but yeah, but the, the Diary you? of a CEO podcast. Uh, yeah, there's some stuff where these incredibly successful people, and when when you hear them speak about doubt, and you go. Oh, I'm I'm glad it's not just me. I'm glad it is even high achievers because I mean, let's be honest. I'm I'm just Richard Shaw. I've been very very lucky to play in some bands and do what I've done with those bands. But I'm not like stupidly successful. I'm not a stupidly high achieving person or anything like that. But at the same time, it doesn't matter who he's had on that podcast. It's amazing how many people mention there's, there's doubt. There's imposter syndrome. There's this constant gratitude for what they have and it doesn't matter where you are or what field you work in i think a lot of people do struggle with that it's very rare i've met someone who is at the top of their game and they feel like they deserved it mm. I, I i have a few friends where um they I have lots of friends that are in this sort of similar situation where they're sort of maybe struggling with this, that, or the other. Um, but, the, and then I think what's quite sad is I have some friends where this isn't the sad bit, but where, where they don't have, where, you know, you could talk to them about this kind of thing and they just would not relate at all. They're just kind of fine, you know? Yeah. Uh, and um, I think it's sad actually how few people, particularly I've had on the podcast actually, where I've chatted to them and they've just kind of, 
you know, and I've maybe asked a sort of somewhat probing question about, you know, have you had any difficulty with this, that or the other? And they kind of been like, no, not really. Um, and, and it's not that they're not like deep and profound people, because I think some people wear it as a bit of a badge of honour, you know, where they almost see it as part of their, uh, maybe not badge of honour is not the right word, but like, a, you know, some sort of uh, um, part of them that, that that is intrinsically attached to them, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's almost a, a romanticising of the sort of things like depression and stuff at times, you know. You, um, you think of the typical guy in the movie in the back alley smoking the cigarette, like, you know, um, it's sort of romanticized in some ways, but um, yeah, which uh, it can be dangerous. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think because then you start to see it can become a part of you, not just like a thing you have, you know. Which I think is quite an important. Yeah, I- I've known certain people again, naming no names, where they just kind of feel like I can only be a true artist if I'm constantly depressed to the point where they will sabotage good things in their life it's like oh it's because i'm a tortured artist i'm it's like no it's not because you're a dick it's like you don't have to be a horrible person to cause this what you feel like should be a trauma like this whole kind of tortured artist thing i think is again an almost romanticized thing and it's genuinely stopped some people from being happy because they genuinely feel like they can only create at their best when they're feeling at their worst. And I think that's been drilled into some people through maybe movies, <laughs> documentaries, I don't know, social pressures. I don't know. I know some people who are generally like, no, I can't have a family because if I have a family, it will interfere with this good thing that I've got going in my life. And it sounds horrible, again, say out loud, but it's like, what what, what good thing? And when you probe a little bit further, it's like, no, they're, they're afraid. They're afraid. They, they, they're very comfortable living this life that they've almost sabotaged a lot <laughs> to keep, because then they can keep this tortured artist facade going. And again, sounds horrible. Sometimes they don't do much with it. Yeah. They're like, one day, one day it'll all happen for me. It's like, no, you've sabotaged a great life for one you thought would bring you happiness. Then what? Now you're going to go head first into depression by your own doing. Mm. Yeah, it's. Um, I think it's definitely a. You can always become comfortable with these things. I think. Um, yeah, and I think people like um, people are definitely, and, and I'm no less guilty of it than anyone else. People are definitely afraid to confront things. You know, I, I had a friend recently I was talking to who um, was having a rough time for various reasons, and I noticed as we were talking on the phone, he would sort of like use humor to deflect a little bit, and I just said straight out to him, I was like, you know, like you're just laughing because you, you know i didn't say it, i probably did say it nearly as bluntly as you're just laughing because you don't really want to think you, you know say this with a straight face to me you know and i didn't mean that in a confrontational way i was saying it to help him you know yeah almost like a defense mechanism yeah. going almost like laugh off the seriousness of the situation because if i really own up to the fact it's this serious i'm gonna see some things i probably don't want to see yeah, that's basically what I said to him, you know. Uh, I mean, but this wasn't it, it kind of the way I described it. It sounds like we were sort of falling out. It wasn't like that at all. It was he was he sort of called me because he was in a bit of a difficult situation. Mm. You know? um, and I was just sort of offering some words of advice and just to, someone to talk to. Um, and yeah, I think it's it's very, a lot of people deflect in various ways. And um, I think part, like I've definitely been guilty of it. And I think I'm trying to now, like I said, this is part of my, when it comes to writing this music, I think part of, part of it for me is I know a big thing was my a big part of my identity is musician songwriter somewhat creative person and I kind of pride myself in that I don't think pride isn't always a bad thing um but then that wasn't aligning with my actions you know I wasn't writing really much at all um so I was kind of I felt like a bit of a fraud and it not impost it wasn't imposter syndrome in the way that um that you maybe have described your experience, but it was kind of in the way that I felt like a bit of a fraud because not, not fraud, but um, I don't know. I didn't feel like what I was doing was lining up with what I, with who I felt I was, which is quite a difficult situation. And there's two options. You can either 
change who you are, which I was, and I was like, well, I'm quite happy with what I'm trying to do. Yeah. But you can actually just do the things that line up with what you're trying to do. And it's, it's a difficult one. Obviously, short term, it does mean facing the fact that maybe I'm not where I want to be with it. Um, and I think that's probably what, that's my deflection, you know, is going, oh, well, I'm not selling out shows at the moment. So it's difficult to confront that when you sat there in your room trying to write songs, you know. Yeah, I, uh, I'm i going to be 100% honest with you. I s- struggle with that often, mm. absolutely often. Um, even very uh, as recent as a couple of days ago, there was this constant, am I even a musician anymore? As weird as it sounds, because on the surface, a lot of people will be like, of course you are, you've done this, 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 this. And I'm like, yeah. I've done this, 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 and this, but I'm not currently doing it. I, I'm a, yes, I'm a self-employed musician, but I've been studying how to be a mortgage advisor. I've just recently passed my qualification for that. And there's almost like this weird slope in my mind where I'm like, what I identified with as being a musician and a songwriter, but I get these periods where I'm not as creative, where I'm not actively writing for bands, where I'm not actively doing stuff. So you're almost like they're just going, am I kidding myself? Like kind of latching onto the past as if like, yes, I I was a musician, I was a songwriter and constantly battling this kind of belief in my head. No, no, I am a songwriter. I am a musician and kind of grabbing onto it. And again, I think a lot of people do struggle with that, especially in something creative when it's not nine to five where you get the the good times where it's like, oh, here we go. I'm super busy. I'm definitely doing the thing. Then all of a sudden you finish the projects or you finish whatever you were doing and you're there going, now what? I'm back just to being Richard Shaw who just plays guitar in his bedroom for his own amusement. Am I technically a musician, a songwriter anymore? Because I'm not actively doing it at this moment in time. And it's like, yeah, I am. Of course I am. But I'm just not as busy as I was, but I will be busy again. And you, you, I think a lot of creative people do s- struggle with that because they're not where they saw themselves being. But the goalposts keep changing. And I find that's the struggle for a lot of creative people. I know it definitely was for me. Once I'd done this, this, and this, it was almost like, well, if I'm not gonna, keeping doing this, this, and this, then what's the point? And that's dangerous as well. I very, thankfully, very quickly snapped out of that. Mm. Like, especially when I left Cradle of Filthy, it's like, well, if I'm not playing venues as big as that, then what's the point in joining another band? <laughs> that lasted about 10 minutes, thankfully. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a dangerous mind game a lot of creatives play with themselves. I know I'm very, very guilty of it. Yeah. I, um, and I, the thing I heard recently that I found quite useful as a framework was um, that all the, the sort of foundation, again, I'm no psychiatrist. This is just the information I found that works for me and I find interesting um, was that sort of the, the foundation of all mental health is agency and gratitude, those two things. Mm. Um, and when you, th- and when you frame it like that, I, I find it useful anyway, because um Agency is obviously just the idea that you can enact things and that you have the sort of power to do th- the things that you're trying to do. Yeah. Um, and then gratitude would be just be, obviously just being thankful for what, what you have got, you know? Mm. Um, and when I think about all the things that I get upset about, I can probably put it in that framework in some way. I'm either probably not thankful enough for what I have got, um, or maybe I'm for whatever reason, not taking the actions that I should be, um, and that I am actually capable of taking. Yeah, hundred um, percent. If I was to, if, if if both of those things kind of disappeared, I think I don't know what issues. I think most of my issues revolve around that in some way. Um, that's how I found that to be a useful framework because then you can think, okay, because you can work on being more grateful for stuff. You can, mm. um, and it's like I, I like things like uh, I would quite quite often I'll think about or I'll write down like what am I grateful for. But then I reframed it to like, what can I be grateful for? Because there are some days where you just feel totally ungrateful for everything. Uh, yeah. But when you say, when what can I be grateful for? It's like, even if I don't feel like that, it's almost like banking it, you know? Mm. You go, okay, well, I know I don't feel like that right now, but I can be fa- thankful for the fact I've got a nice flat or, you know, um, or I've got friends or I've got, you know, I live in a city where there's cool things going on. There's all these things you can pick. Mm. You know? 
exactly. I think anyone, even in the worst situation, it sounds a bit easy. Like, um, it's very people are very quick to say oh, it was easy for you to say, but like you could say that any step of the ladder, can you really? It, that's the thing, and I a hundred percent agree with you. The the number of times I've actively practiced gratitude, I've been doing that the last few years really not that not that it was ever an issue before but when stuff was going on in my, in my life it's like okay, i've got a lot of good things going on and it kind of just you, you're uh, as weird as it sounds a lot of people have to actively practice being happy and i did for the longest time because again you're always striving you're working on something it was almost like happiness will happen when when i've but again goalposts keep shifting so i got into the habit of like daily more not to go too hippy trippy with it but like daily morning gratitude where it's like right this this is what i've got this is what's down the pipeline of this is what i've done in the past this is all this is great and it kind of more puts me in that just better mindset and uh anything i can like you were saying anything that i can actively work towards i will put those steps in place because i can only blame myself if those things don't happen but it's amazing how many people I've met, especially in creative industries, where they will, sounds horrible, they blame other people for stuff that's not happened. I'm not where I want to be in life because of this, 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 this reason, and not once to they blame themselves. And it's just like, I think there's some things you need to address. And it, it, I could see myself going down that road a few years back absolutely where i was just like i'm not where i want to be even though on the surface everything was great when i started practicing gratitude and controlling the things that i could control like putting steps in place to do things it's amazing one it's amazing how happy i felt and two how many things kind of came to fruition because i actively put the steps in to make it happen for myself instead of waiting for someone to wave a magic wand, which it's amazing. Again, how many people I, I meet who blame others for something that's not gone to plan. Mm. So yeah, more people need to practice gratitude. I'm sure. Yeah. I think what I heard someone say that you, um, something to the effect of you rise, you don't rise to your goals. You fall to your systems and habits. Yeah. You know, and, and absolutely. I, same with this gratitude thing. It's like, you can't you're not just if you just want to be happy or or grateful or whatever it you, i don't think you it just happens i think you actually you know especially when there are so many things that you can turn to that make you feel worse about yourself um i think you have got to quite actively pursue personally i think you've got to quite actively try and just pursue that you know uh yeah. and by and doing it habitually you know um it's not actually difficult to sit down for two minutes you know it's not like you know, it can be maybe challenging for you to try and get yourself in the right mindset, I guess, but just sit down and even just think about what you're, what's, what you're grateful for. Cause it, I think everyone's the same five things, you know, it's yeah. today, you know, like, um, yeah, it's, it's one of those things like I've never, don't get me wrong. I've never been an active like journaler, mm. if journaler is a word, but I did try it a few times when I first started with a whole gratitude act exercise i feel like i don't really need to do it so much anymore it's more almost more of a mental checklist and that i keep adding to as the days go on and uh but actively getting it from the brain onto written word onto a page it's amazing when you just look at it and go no that's not too bad <laughs> it's not yeah. bad actually you know and it just kind of i don't know it just puts things in in perspective and even uh, even weirdly enough, I think some people spend far too much time on social media. Mm. And I, I, I know I did. There was almost like this constant pressure to be, am I, again, am I an active working musician if I'm not uploading content a million times a week and engaging? It's all about the engagement and the content. Otherwise, you're not a success. And that's just pure bollocks absolute pure bollocks because all that was i found was happening to me it was almost i was just comparing myself to what other people are doing it's like oh this person's more successful because they're uploading videos more than i am and their videos look better than mine and, and yeah, yeah, nah. <laughs> so it, it, thankfully i've kind of got out of that 
I can slip into it if I'm not careful. But again, that's another active thing where I go, no, no, no. Comparison is the thief of joy and all that. Mm. It's an amazing how happy I feel when I go off of social media for a little while. Yeah, it's um, it's a blessing and a curse, I think, because you can get a lot out of social media. But um... absolutely, I'm not anti-social media by any means. Social me, me, media, as a friend of mine calls it, because it is, it's that, just it, it, it's just the ego game, isn't it? Like for a lot of people, like nobody puts up their worst bits of their life on social media. So you assume you go on social media, you assume everyone's life is better than yours, and it's just absolutely not the case. And um, yeah, it was just one of those things where I did, I did, I went through this weird thing where I was like going, well, if I'm not doing this, if I'm not doing that, like almost like putting life aside so I could make content and you're there just going, and I'm not like a big social media, I'm not like a YouTuber or anything like that, but the number of times I've got YouTuber friends who are just like, yeah, I don't have a life. So I'm just constantly writing, filming and editing contact, content. It's like, yeah, when was the last time you saw your parents? They're like, oh yeah, months ago. And we live down the road. Because I'm constantly working on my my hustle, man. He's yeah. Figuring. It feels like as well with the way content is nowadays. Um, I think YouTube's a little different, but particularly things like Instagram, TikTok, and all these more short form ones, there's very little in the way of like legacy. It doesn't, um, in terms of like, if I put out a YouTube video in five years times, it might say I put out, a, you know, say we talk about something in particular that becomes relevant in four or five years or whatever, mm. um, it might still pop up. But when yeah. you look at Instagram shorts and, and all it reels and all that, um, you have to keep going. You can't just like have this wealth of um, videos that people will like flick through. You have to just keep producing. It's like you have to stay on the, on the wheel. Um, so I, I think it's quite, you've got to, I think you've just got to decide what you can, you know, if you want to do the content thing, I think you've just got to decide what you can sustain. Mm. What, exactly. What, it's almost like a full-time job. My friends who oh, yeah. are oh, YouTubers. Yeah, for sure. I, there's it, a plenty I've had on the podcast, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where they're just like, before they were full-time YouTubers, YouTube was already a full-time job. They would do nine to five, Monday to Friday, like their actual job. And then like evenings and weekends was YouTube until they could go right now could technically quit my job to do YouTube full time. And then YouTube, YouTube became the Monday to Friday, nine to five and beyond. So there's one particular YouTube friend of mine. He's like, he kind of regrets it. He, he doesn't complain too much, but, uh, cause he does well out of it. But at the same time, he's like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a musician who wanted to write and play guitar and, I'm not really doing that. I'm just spending my days editing videos and not really playing guitar all that much. He feels like he's not actually being that creative, but he's kind of got on the hamster wheel of got to keep the content coming. Mm. So it's, know, it's, had... it's, it's a weird game. Yeah, I think you've got, again, like with any job, if you, you, you're at the best when you love it. And I know some people, my YouTube friends who, who absolutely love it. Don't get me wrong. It's like, they can't imagine doing anything else. And if you absolutely love it, I think that's the best way to go. But if you're kind of doing it because you think it will get you more likes or more followers, I think your heart's in the wrong place and you'll be bitterly disappointed and you'll last about two weeks before you go, ah, sod this. Mm. My um, my one sort of the main thing that I've picked up and I've seen a few, I'm definitely not going to out anyone because there's a few things that I've seen where I've thought, um, not you've made a mistake here, but like I don't think this has gone how you thought it would where – people have built big followings, but not around the thing they're really trying to do. I.e. a lot of musicians, what they want to do is write music and they'll develop a following doing something where music is like the the foundation, but really it's not musical in inverted commas. I don't mean yeah. that in a bad way. You know, if you want to do that, that's totally fine. And there's lots of cool stuff out there like that. But, you know, people who want, whose primary goal is they want to write music. And I think they equate following with immediate you know, oh, well, if I get 300,000 followers for whatever it is, and then I put some music out, everyone's going to go and listen. And yeah. I think y you can't assume that actually, I mean, that, you know, don't get me wrong. It's not going to be a 0% conversion, is it? But I think that conversion rate is a lot lower than people suspect. You know, if you write, if you would, yeah, you know, if you make content that isn't, you know, and that's why I've been trying to just put out little songwriting clips because I just want to build an audience around that, you know, uh, yeah. Because then if I put music out, hopefully anyone that follows me will go, oh, well, I followed him because of that in sole reason, you know? Yeah. 
that's my plan anyway. You've just got to, as long as you enjoy what you're doing, because otherwise it will become a chore. You end up chasing trends. I mean, I just don't understand TikTok. I've got a TikTok. I don't use my, I, I have got I just don't really, every now and again, I'll post something that will just go on Instagram and Facebook anyway. Um, just because you never know. And uh, I was having this conversation with a friend who, there's a couple of bands that will remain nameless, but he, he works for a couple of bands. And they had this great idea to kind of bring like a TikTok star on tour with them. I think I'm trying to figure it out in my head now, but go on. And in the hope it would translate into ticket sales. And it really didn't. Mm. <laughs> For both bands, they're like, yeah, but this person's exploding on TikTok right now. If we bring them onto like open for us or have them be part of the band, people will go just to see them. No. It, it doesn't translate. It doesn't translate into ticket sales and live performance because people don't want to see half hour, 45 minute, hour and a half, whatever long set by this person. They want to see a 20 second long video and then scroll away. Yeah, they might have a, a lot of followers and they seem to be killing it on their chosen social media, but it it's very, very rare it translates into ticket sales. And um, don't get me wrong, it does happen but it's very rare. <laughs> so, and some, some bands have made that mistake, but going, well, if we become really big on TikTok, we'll be relevant again. And I've seen some bands do some really cringy stuff on TikTok where you're just like, they're going, you would never have done that in a million big bands, big bands trying to make a TikTok go viral. And you're just like, oh, this is horrible. This is horrible to watch. I recently, uh, the, the one band I will out just because I actually, I'm, I'm a massive March and Monty fan or you're a big, I know you're, well, you literally got the, but the, um, uh, for anyone listening, got, you got the Alter Bridge shirt on, but the, the recent Creed TikTok where Scott, yeah, I saw it. Oh, that's <laughs> terrible. It's rubbish. It's like, oh, come on guys. You, you, just, you, you shouldn't need to do that when well, a band as big as them yeah. feel like they need to do a TikTok to yeah. be relevant. It just made me laugh, and I'm like, oh, dear. Oh. I think as long I, I don't know, as long as they do kind of see the funny side of it, great. But if I it's done it. with all seriousness of going, we need to get a TikTok. Mm. We need to get get trending on TikTok. It's like, I think anyone who and this is sounds really harsh, but I think anyone who's actively trying to trend on TikTok is aiming for the wrong thing. Because nobody knows what's going to be trending. So if you're actively trying to trend on any kind of social media, I don't know. <laughs> it's a bit yeah. weird. I think if you're, it depends. I think if you're, if you're, there are lots of people who really enjoy just doing what's trending. And if that's your mm. thing, if that's what you're trying to do, then great. But I think if you're trying to do something else and then you're also trying to trend on TikTok just so the other thing works, then mm. I think you're just, that's an uphill battle that you're never going to win. But I think, you know, there are plenty of people who just like hopping on trends and doing that, and that's what they enjoy doing. And then, yeah, yeah, yeah. this is what I mean. I, I know I do sound too harsh. If people do genuinely enjoy doing it, then absolutely 100% do it because it doesn't make any difference to me. You know what I mean? Um, but it doesn't affect my happiness if other people are trying to make themselves happy. You know what I mean? Like, I, think, I think everybody... Not to sound too preachy, but I think if everybody kind of lived like that, then there'd be fewer problems in the world. It's like that makes you happy, cool. <laughs> as long as it's consenting and legal, you know, yeah. whatever makes you happy, you know. Um, so I don't know, yeah, but, but trying to chase things because they think it will make them happy further down the line. That's that's a dangerous way of thinking. I, I say that as somebody who who definitely thought like that. Once I'd reached a certain goal, it's like now I need to do this one in order to be happy. I need I need more followers. I need more of this. I need more of that. Otherwise, I'm not. Again, the goalposts keep shifting. Um, so yeah, it can be a dangerous way to be. But if gen gen people genuinely love doing that, then hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Well, hopefully, that's, I think that's a good um, 
you know, I think I, I think people will because I can relate to what you've sort of been talking about. So I'm sure plenty of other people out there will. Um, so hopefully that was a good, um, yeah, like a nice relatable um, thing that hopefully people can pull some wisdom from um more from your end than mine but you know. I, I hope so because i don't want to sound too preachy no no not at all uh, I, I, it's I, just because it, i i know obviously i've been incredibly fortunate in this life i've been so fortunate i've seen the world i've played with a couple of big bands and I, i've done a lot of very cool stuff in my life in terms of a music career especially and um yeah you're constantly like pulling and your, your brain goes in a few different directions going now I need to, do I need to capitalize on this? Maybe I should start a TikTok and oh, do I, I didn't start a TikTok for that reason. It was more just an outlet just to do some videos and, you know, in the same way Instagram was. I put off doing Instagram for the longest time. I think I was in Cradle of Filth for something like four years before I got on Instagram and all this kind of stuff. And just and then, then ironically, Instagram has done more for me than I ever thought it would. Um, but I'm not a huge, huge Instagrammer or anything like that. It's it's just some stuff's just happened by accident. But it's all about putting things in perspective. And I was I was that person who was in danger of my happiness lives somewhere over the rainbow. And again, not to get too preachy or be a massive downer, but I did find that was the way for the longest time. That is there's there's happiness once i've done this 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 and this i'll be really happy and i'll be set and it's just not what happens because it's amazing how many of those things i achieved and i felt exactly the same mm. <laughs> so you gotta be careful not, um, not with the outside things i think is the way to it is it, people have to actively work on their happiness i think not not many people I've met have naturally have a sunny disposition. Like, like not many people are happy as a default setting. Yeah, um, we live in England, so it's you know there's there's only so much you can do. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. But you can actively work on it, and like I don't know, not again, not to get too preachy, but like I recently, well, not so recently, in the last eighteen months or so, just exercising. You say you go to the gym. I don't go to the gym, but I've got a like a little exercise bike. That I do, do your stories, morning. yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it, that, that, I, I, the only reason I really put it on Instagram is more for accountability, because mm. it's a that is, it's not to show off. I try not to go, oh, look, look what I'm doing. Like I'm juggling parenthood and I'm still working out. Like, like I know some people do. Like I don't do it. For, it might, it might, it might come across as that. I don't want it to be. Okay. It's more of a this is for my accountability because it's amazing how many people when I don't put that up, people go, did you work out today? And I'm like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> But so, so literally one person, one very astute person was like, I've noticed for the last three days, you've not posted something. Have you, have you slacked off? I was like, whoa, I suppose I have. Probably, yes. <laughs> I'm being honest with myself, I probably have slacked off. So it just becomes one of those things where it's like every now and again, I go, yeah, it just I have some accountability for myself to make me do it. Yeah, yeah, I always yeah. feel good afterwards as well. I uh, yeah, I found afterwards. it's been one of the biggest changes in my um like disposition like we're talking about you know it's um just getting fitter and stronger and you just feel you just feel better like it's obviously the, there's the physic there's the sort of um you feel better in yourself like um what's the word just sort of physiologically more you know more awake and just ironically although like i said i had to run downstairs get my earphones i was out of breath when i ran back up but i ran down and up the stairs so three flights down and so six you know so I, I think it's nice to be out of breath i put i had a good yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely um, but yeah, I definitely feel better for it. Um, so I'd certainly advocate anyone getting into it. I think I've put on about six or seven, six, between six and eight kilos since early this year. Um, yeah. yeah, like good kilos, not bad. Yeah, yeah good kilos. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully anyway, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, great stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, cool. Well, we'll, um, we'll finish up with, so I need a question for the next conversation to open the next one like yours. Um, and an artist pick that you want to plug to the world. Okay. Is everybody that you interview usually a music uh, a musician? Yeah, they'll be in some way musically inclined at the very okay. least. Um, okay. Um Okay, I'll make it a bit more broad. Hopefully, I'll see how see how I can word this. Um I think broad questions the the way forward. 
People what, put a lot of pressure. What, what was the moment that was the point of no return? Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah. That didn't even that didn't even have to be a musical thing, really. Necessarily, no, that's what I'm thinking. Like, it's, I was thinking of a more music based one, and I was like, okay, yeah. what what was the because I find that with a lot of musicians where it's like there's a moment where it's like. This is me now. This I. This is me for the rest of my life, and it, it, it is usually a turning point where it's like I could have, I could have gone down this fork in the road, but I didn't. I could have followed the white rabbit. To well, I did follow the white rabbit, you know, <laughs> down this. Yeah. This is my life now. Whereas I could have been quote unquote normal. Mm. What 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 was that point of no return? Yeah, when I was born. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You'd be surprised. Some people do do say that when I've asked them similar questions. It's like they just go, "I've never known anything different." And it's like, well, fair enough. Yeah, do that. Yeah. But for some people, myself included, I knew there was a point where it's like, "Nah, um, I think this is it now. I think this is my identity mm. forever. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> I am a musician, whether I like it or not." Kind of thing. Yeah. I chose this path at this point, mm. and that's it. That's my life. And then, so, okay, so I need, I also need uh, an artist pick, someone that you want to... Uh, the Parallax Method. Okay, cool. Yeah, nice. Nice one. Um, and then, do you have anything you want to plug? Um, I still have the book. Um, so I have a book you can that's put on available screen. on Amazon. Oh, I can, yeah, I've got... There we so go. You probably can't see it, but it, yeah, it's uh, Fretboard and Songwriting Theories for Metalheads. Uh, that's available on Amazon worldwide. So the book's still out. I am still actively recording guitars for people. So if they want guitars on their projects or a co-writer or anything, that's kind of more where where my musician stuff is now. I'm still doing the whole session musician thing, like touring, writing, recording, but it's more like as an absolute freelancer for whoever wants me. So um yeah, that's how, kind of how it goes right now. So if anybody wants guitars on their stuff, let me know. Wicked. Well, cool. It's uh, it's good to catch up. Thanks for thanks for chatting. Yeah, cheers, Joe. I've enjoyed this. Like, yeah, I know it kind of gets a little bit deep from time to time, deep-ish, I suppose. Yeah. No, it's wicked, man. But, uh, it's good. No, thanks for having me on. Appreciate it.